Thank you. Um, yeah, good afternoon, JS Heroes. Uh, I'm really excited to be here in front of so many of you, uh, both as a speaker and an organizer. So I'm really happy with how this is turning out. I think that you guys are amazing here. And we're really doing something that we know that our efforts were not in vain for, for the whole thing that we're doing. Now, just a, just a short thing I want to, to announce. Initially, we had 20 speakers on our list for the two days of conference, but unfortunately, two of the speakers could not make it. Uh, we found out this week about that, so we had to uh, adjust a bit the agenda. That's why you will see some of the talks maybe for 45 minutes. We wanted to have some consistency at first, but then we realized we need to keep up the schedule. So uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Liran, Gautam, and Ovidiu for taking the extra effort to um, change on demand the, the time that you have allocated for this. Now, as a funny story, um, this, is a, this is a talk I, I wanted to give like since a year ago, and I kept, I kept adding my ideas together and putting all, all of it together. And uh, when I did the first uh, try at home, uh, it turned out like 38 minutes or 36 minutes. And then I started tweeting like, hey guys, do you have any uh, ideas how I could uh, make this shorter? And yeah, I, I, stopped, I started to remove content. And then, guess what? I now need more content on it. So um, yeah. So then I, I did an, another, um, another try uh, just yesterday because I knew I had like, uh, more content. And I was pretty happy with it. But then we had the talks in the morning First it was Tudor, then it was Benedek, and I just realized that they covered a lot of these things. So yeah, it, this will be pretty hard for me. Okay, I'm, um, I want to talk about JavaScript in general, not about front-end or back-end, JavaScript as, as a language, as JavaScript as the ecosystem. And when I think of, of the ecosystem, or when you think, actually, uh, of the ecosystem today, you might think of something like this, or you've seen other pictures with uh, snappy logos of, of all the frameworks and all the tools that we are using, all the libraries, all the testing tools, all, all the back-end frameworks, front-end frameworks, and so on. This, is the, the, this doesn't even cover half of them, but it, this says a lot about how complex the ecosystem is. Unfortunately, what I don't like is that people see this and they, they label it as fatigue. And I think that the fatigue comes from, has, comes from different sources actually. And the main thing on which I, the main idea on which I want to focus is our inability to abstract. We are developers, we are engineers, so we have this natural inability to abstract. It's not something that, uh, it's, not, it's not a bad thing that we have. Uh, we always want to look under the hood of something, right? We want to understand how everything works, how, how the internals of something work. And we have this problem, and abstract, abstracting things is a very difficult thing. Maybe, it's maybe the most difficult thing in programming, and it, it revolves around all ecosystem. it, ecosystems. It's not a JavaScript problem. And we often under-abstract or over-abstract, right? We either go too deep into something, we lose ourselves into the details, or we are over-abstracting. We just use something that's at a very high-level use case for something that we actually need a deeper, uh, deeper look into. So this inability to abstract, it may, it's very hard to like, pinpoint it, like this is it, this is the problem. But I found, while doing the research, while thinking about the talk, I found two ideas that on which I wanted to build a talk. Uh, the first problem is a more generic one. It's happening in, in a lot of ecosystem it, systems. It's happening in software in general. It's how much focus we give to something of uh, less or more importance, right? You would assume 
that this is how the software works. Right? This is how the software minds work. We focus on the important things. We, give, we, we put more energy behind the important things and not, uh, not the, the less important ones. Well, unfortunately, reality kicks in. And this is what's happening. This is uh, the law of, or law of triviality, which says that we, are, we have this in nature to fight over unimportant things, right? Should I use tabs or spaces? Should I add semicolons in JavaScript? Should I use Angular or React? I would argue that even that is not an important question to ask. I think the important questions to ask when building software are things like, is this performant enough? Is this secure enough? Is, does it uh, respect all the security uh, standards? Uh, am I building the right features for my users? Um, and things like that, right? Think, these are the things that matter. These are the things on which we should put more effort than picking up frameworks or making decisions, right? Those are one-time decisions. It should be less effort Less and less effort on that. The second, the second problem, which derives from this inability to abstract, is specific to JavaScript. It's not, not necessarily a problem. It's, it's uh, the call. It, it's the, the outcome, actually, how, how the ecosystem evolved. And I like to compare the JavaScript ecosystem with another ecosystem, which, which I'm pretty familiar with, which is the Ruby ecosystem. Like any, I'm going to say ecosystem like 20, 30 times, so sorry for this. Um, like any uh, ecosystem, <laughs> it all starts from popularity, right? You cannot really have an ecosystem. You cannot have people behind it without um, some sort of popularity, some sort of idea that's, um, that's, that, that looks interesting for most of us. So out of popularity, there's a natural tendency to go into chaos. Because, and, but sorry, just as a disclaimer, this is an, in an open system. When, where the, the language is, is pretty much open, the specifications are open source, and there's no one organization or one person controlling where the language is heading. So this is the, the, the path from popularity to chaos. Then what happened in Ruby, it reached Convention, this is the stage at which they reached. Convention was brought in Ruby by Ruby on Rails. Uh, if there are any Ruby developers here, I'm pretty sure that almost all of them, in some sort, in, in some manner, they do Ruby on Rails because it's, it's standard for the Ruby community, right? 95% probably of the developers work in Ruby on Rails. And the framework is, is great and is built around this idea of convention over configuration. They make the decisions for you. They have a set of conventions in place that allow you to start working on the features, or in other words, allow you to start asking the right questions at the beginning of the project. But a convention that was true or valid in 10 years ago is not necessarily the same convention today. And unfortunately, the problem with conventions is that they cannot change. If they change, they're a different thing. They're, it's a different standard. So you have to slowly adapt them. You cannot radically change them. So the struggle today in the Ruby ecosystem is to go from convention to configuration, to find, the, to find maybe alternatives that can work around the, the new uh, advances that we have on the web platform, to focus on, on mobile, for example, which was not a problem 10 years ago. So this is a struggle currently in the Ruby ecosystem. Our friend, JavaScript, has a different story. Popularity led to chaos, same story. Maybe chaos was there for too many years. But then what happened is that it turned to configuration. There were multiple things happening at the same time in multiple places, multiple companies, people working on different setups, different configurations, different ways of building apps with JavaScript, whether it's front and back end, whether it's mobile 
uh, all the frameworks and so on. But this, because there was no convention, because there were no standard, it often led back to chaos. And we have this vicious circle, which I think we passed. We are now heading towards convention in the JavaScript world. So today, the JavaScript and the Ruby ecosystems are reversed one from another, as they are find, trying to find ways to have more flexibility for developers, to give them more power to actually uh, adapt their application to the needs, uh, today's needs of the, of the web or of the mobile. In JavaScript, we have all the flexibility, and we're striving to find the conventions. We're trying to find some sort of ideas, concepts that will allow us to focus on the important things. This here is the period that we've lived through. The upper part is the JavaScript fatigue, but we are past that. We are moving into something else. In order to see that, let's plot this over the years. Um, took the liberty to try to find the ages of JavaScript. And I found four different periods. Number one, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I don't know how to name it. <laughs> From its inception to 2007, JavaScript was mostly used as a secondary language, scripting thing used for animating some forms and buttons. But that's it. There was no real ecosystem around it. It started to appear maybe 2006, 2007. Then we have the jQuery era. Ajax, uh, all the libraries like underscore jQuery, uh, the dynamics of the web changing, and more and more focus into JavaScript, right? This is, is anyone here, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, is anyone here who did JavaScript before 2007? Okay. All of you should be on the stage also. Some of you are already. <laughs> because it's a, very, it's, it's a very long way. And it's, it, in the language came, um, had a very nice road from all, for all these years. And it's, rather, it's radically different than it was before. Then we have MVC. During this time, we started working with Backbone, with Angular, with Ember, with React. Do you, do you remember the time when React was the V in MVC? Right? This is how it was advertised on the, on the homepage by Facebook. This, is, this tells a lot about how powerful MVC was as a concept. And now we have components. But together with components, we have different conventions that we're moving towards. MVC was a convention, was a standard, but you can all agree that most of the MVC frameworks were so different one, than, one from another that they didn't really follow a, a set of conventions. Components, on the other hand, are conventions today. You can't really imagine a very popular front-end framework today without components, and they obey pretty much the same rules. So we're heading towards a convention with components. But then we have other things spawned, like unidirectional data flows. Right? The idea of uh, Flux, uh, which spawned into Redux, uh, Observables, RxJS, stuff like that, which are moving towards a convention. Right? All the libraries are obeying the same set of conventions. Things like how we handle CSS now, CSS in JavaScript. Again, a convention on top of which all the libraries are being built. So if we separate these two eras, we understand now better that MVC was the era in which we felt the fatigue. We still feel it today because it's, we tend to live in the past. That's, that's the sad reality. We tend to think of, OK, I have, I have this project which was written three years ago in Angular 1. Now I have to upgrade it. That's the wrong way of thinking. OK, it's something that you have to do, but it's not something that you should blame React for or Angular 2. What we have today is a better era. We don't, live into the front, we don't live into the JavaScript fatigue world. 
if you ask me. This is the, um, Paul, maybe you can uh, help me here with the uh, uh, Clos-Luz castle in central France. Uh, I have no French skills. Um, this is the place where uh, Leonardo da Vinci retreated towards the end of his life. This is where he developed a lot of interesting prototypes and inventions. This is where he built things like the helicopter or the revolving bridge or the tank or even things like um, uh, there's a prototype for an airplane and for parachute, right? Think about it. A parachute to jump from what? Okay? He was a visionary and he built these concepts that he thought one day would actually exist in, I don't know, let's say mainstream. And think how frustrating would have been for Da Vinci to work on his prototypes, to, 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 to show them to the world, and people saying, ah, dude, that sounds really cool. I really like to use this, but I feel so fatigued by all these cool things that you're building. Um, we are fine with watching Mona Lisa, really. We don't need all these things now. Uh, okay, I know it's a very, uh, very um, eccentric, let's say, parallel, but think of, now, think of this in terms of today's ecosystem and what, it, what is happening. Think of all the people that put great effort into the conventions that we have, into um, the components, people behind frameworks, people behind libraries, behind ideas, people that you see them already working on different things in the ecosystem. They don't just have their framework and they want you to use their framework because that's the best. They try to work and actually move the ecosystem further. So I think we should renounce this JavaScript fatigue term because we live in the JavaScript Renaissance area where we have all these wonderful tools that we need to use. But, okay, so I, I'm really happy that you agree with me, but this is not the end of the talk because I wanted, I, whenever you have something to prove, I think that you should, once you prove it, you should ask yourself, now what? What, like I proved to you that there's no JavaScript fatigue? So what's the point of it? Because just proving something doesn't solve problems, doesn't actually move something further. I think that now we should look a bit at this entire period and see how it helped us as professionals, if it helped us. And this is the question I've been having. This is a question that's been bugging me for a year. Are we better professionals because we've been through all these uh, fatigue world or all these transformations that the ecosystem suffered? And I think yes. But not just because, okay, that's well, from the top of my head an answer. I have a few lessons that I think we learned along, um, along the way, which I'd like to share with you. And for that, I'm going to need my assistants, Alice and Bob. Alice is a front-end developer, Bob is a back-end developer. And they work in before uh, 2011. They work in the era of, of jQuery. Alice does mostly HTML, CSS, front-end kind of thing where Bob is a Ruby or a PHP developer working with, with the backend. So w the first transformation that occurred during this time, or the first thing that they had to do, is learn to collaborate. They became JavaScript developers. Because we did not have the idea of a JavaScript developer before 2007. I think this is the first lesson. They, they brought things, different things on the table. Alice brought from the front-end world attention to detail, um, orientation towards the customer, towards the user experience. Bob brought the rigorosity of a back-end language, uh, unless he was a PHP developer, but 
anyway, um, yeah, sorry, I, I feel so bad for the PHP developers. We kept mocking them. <laughs> okay, um, so lesson one. We learn from each other. We came into this world of JavaScript with different skills. We put all our skills on the table and we took what's best out of them. The JavaScript developers of today did not exist 10 years ago. So it's something that, that's something that appeared out of the best practices or out of the good practices of different roles and responsibilities on projects. Moving ahead, Alice and Bob start to learn, start to learn front end. Uh, sorry, start to learn JavaScript in the front end, more and more JavaScript as, as the years go by. And they start learning Backbone, which is one of the first frameworks. And that's the, like the learning curve for Backbone, right? They start from scratch because they have no idea how, what a JavaScript framework is. After all, what's a single page application? So it takes them a lot of time. And then Bob, one day says, I want to learn Angular. So the curve drops close to zero because he has to relearn a lot of new things. He has to understand now what the hell is two-way binding, what's a directive, what's a service, things that did not exist in Backbone. Then he moves to React and he's caught up in this ever-changing framework world where he always has to go down to zero or close to zero and relearn everything again and again and again. Alice here also starts to learn Angular and she realizes that this happened before with Backbone, so she doesn't want to make the same mistakes. So she learns something else called JavaScript. We'll see in a moment what that is exactly. But she learns some concepts, she learns the language, she learns uh, ideas that transcend the framework world, that go from one framework to another. So now Alice, uh, sorry, while Bob continues his ever-going quest for what's the next hot framework, Alice has much, spends less time learning frameworks now and learning how to use frameworks. So she can move on also to the next framework if, if need be. But you see what's happening here? They reached at the same point in time, at the same level. Who do you think has the advantage now? <laughs> okay. This is what's happening even today. If, if you are focusing on, on core skills, if you think that uh, maybe you're wasting time understanding all the aspects of the language, uh, all the idea behind components, the theory behind it, you might think that, okay, I'm wasting time while others are learning frameworks. And I see that my friend here, also, who also has pretty much the same experience as I do, knows the same stuff as I do, right? Because he knows also Backbone and Angular and React, so, it, so do I. But trust me, I would always pick Alice over Bob to work with. Because I know that Alice now has a bigger advantage moving ahead. And we're just at the beginning of our, of our path here. So what is that JavaScript thing? Because it's, it was a very generic thing. Well, it starts from JavaScript. This is the, um, the, the core, right? The language, the, the syntax, the, everything revol revolving the, the, the language itself. We put on top a few programming paradigms, like functional programming, object-oriented programming, asynchronous programming as the asynchronous nature of JavaScript. We understand these skills also. Then we go to concepts in our ecosystem. Things like components, things like Flux, like virtual DOM, what a virtual DOM is, what it does, uh, moving ahead with directions like progressive web app, offline applications, webpack as not necessarily the library, but more like the idea of module bundling and uh, building yourself the setup for a project. 
Then come the frameworks and the libraries that we use, whether they are front-end or back-end or uh, whether it's Electron or doesn't matter. What matters is that you should always start from the center and take each step, one step at a time. Never skip a stage. Because if you skip a stage, you end up like Bob. Bob is actually just trying to penetrate the circle from the outside, just grabbing React. Okay, now I learned React, then grabbing Angular, now I learn Angular. Alice started from the center, and she has a much good foundation now on which to build. And this is the lesson number two. These things, right, again, these things won't exist in a few years. Maybe not all of them, but they will die. Frameworks come and die, libraries come and die. The concepts behind them stay. Once we have this move in the JavaScript world from configuration, from configurability to a conventional thinking, once we think in terms of these concepts that repeat themselves, these become our transferable knowledge. Knowledge that gets transferred from one framework to another without losing any time or any effort. So it's like starting with an advantage already. And this is lesson number two. We build on strong foundation. We teach others to learn the right way, to learn, start from the core, start from the concepts, and to build our, our knowledge on a strong foundation. And everything we learn, then we can put on top of that. Lesson number three is related to how we interact with each other. Because in all that era, all that time of chaos and configuration and lack of convention, we had to learn things by ourselves. And Alice and Bob, let's say they meet up at a conference, and Alice debates that they need, she needs, or we need types in JavaScript, while Bob says that we don't need types. And they argue, they uh, debate over this, which is totally okay. And there are two outcomes. They either agree or they disagree, of course. So one, uh, one idea is that they agree and they both start using TypeScript. They, they both discover what TypeScript is about, why they need TypeScript to, to bring types to JavaScript, so they agree. Or they can disagree. And Alice, who is still convinced that types are good, she uses TypeScript and Bob doesn't. Any outcome is fine. That's the beauty of a non-conventional ecosystem. Nobody has to tell you, you have to do it this way, right? Nobody in the Java world asks themselves, like, maybe we actually don't need classes in JavaScript, in Java? I, I don't know. If there's a Java developer that actually uh, has this question, it, he should start learning JavaScript. Um, but so that, the outcome is not important here. It's this that matters. Two sides. First, we learn. First, we dig, dig down into the problem. This is, of course, also a source of fatigue and exhaustion. It's absolutely natural. But we learn things the hard way. And this makes us better as professionals. And once we learn, we do. We don't just do because someone says, this is the convention. You have to work by this convention. So this is what I think molded us into better professionals. This is lesson number three. Learn by doing. And you notice that these lessons are also in line with what Paul was mentioning in the morning about the missions of communities and the idea of, of meetups and conferences and, and why we do what we do. Because the lessons, if I'm going to, to recap them, are we share things, so we learn from each other, we teach the right concepts, and we learn by doing, right? Sharing, learning, and teaching. These are the core values of the JavaScript ecosystem and the core values of our community and of communities worldwide. And I think all this all leads into uh, something that I call 
developer maturity or ecosystem maturity. This is, it's down the road, right? We haven't entirely reached there, but we have it in sight for the first time, or we have it in sight ever since 2015, which was that point where we switched to a conventional thinking. And this maturity is visible everywhere in the, in the JavaScript world today because we have complex applications, we have people starting to focus on important things. And in terms of maturity, uh, there's this tweet from Mark, who is here. Which, uh, I told you I'm gonna use the tweet, uh, which I really liked. And it says a lot about what a, develop, what a, a mature uh, um, developer should think about, right? right? Fatigue was when we had all that DOM manipulation spaghetti, but there we, were, we, we could not test it. We could not properly look at it as a unit, right? We had to just throw out some automate, UI automation to test that properly. And I think maturity comes in different flavors now. Funny thing, I thought few people knew about this, but then it was mentioned in two talks. Stanford announced at the beginning of the year that the Java a computer science class that they have, basic computer science, in, which was uh, taught in Java, is going to be replaced with JavaScript. Because they say that it's, it's a language that reached a certain maturity and from which students have a lot to learn. Yeah, so that's what it says actually there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we have a lot of things still to do. But we have to be also... Um, we have to think of how fortunate we are because we have these cool and awesome materials available for us online, one click away. Whether they are online courses, online videos, whether they are talks at conferences that you have online. There's, there's an, so much knowledge open now that we have to really be thankful for that because this is what's keeping the ecosystem in motion. This is what's driving us forward. We are able to share the ideas like this, right? And think how useful it would have been in the Middle Ages or in the actual Renaissance area, uh, era if they had something like this. Can you imagine a course by Leonardo da Vinci on structural engineering? Can you think what a huge difference that would have made to the world today? So think, think deeply about this. Think how important it is that we have this today and we can take advantage of this. We need to enjoy the ride. We need to stop referring to the JavaScript world as this ugly spaghetti thing, fatigue. I, I don't want to hear those words anymore. We are very fortunate to have all the learning materials, to have the communities around us, to learn and to share and to teach others and to progress as humans. So I think this will allow us to move forward at a much, uh, to move forward uh, uh, at a much rapid pace than it was in history. Thank you. Okay, PHP jokes are fun, but lots of amazing products are using it, really. Of course, yeah. It doesn't, make, uh, it doesn't matter if you're using Angular or React as long as you make great stuff. I totally agree with this, since it's not a question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, really, I, I really agree with this. And as, as Tudor was saying, uh, there were a lot of uh, really nice articles, even this year, about uh, for example, how Slack is using PHP, and we posted them on the on the community. We we it's it's just some it's not something that we should be making fun of. And still, if you think Facebook is using still PHP, and a lot of uh, huge uh, websites they are still using PHP, right? It's still. <laughs> the problem about conventions in open systems is that let's say we have. 12 standards, so someone decides to solve that and we have 30 standards. Yeah, that's true. That's the, um, how standards proliferate, right? Um, yes, but the idea of having a conventional system is that we have one standard. 
right? We have one standard for the language, which is ES 2015 or ES 2016 or ES 2017, it doesn't matter, but it's one standard that keeps evolving, right? And each of the concepts that we discussed, like the components, the, um, the unidirectional flows, they are one standard that is, uh, is approached by all the frameworks. When did you feel comfortable enough with JavaScript and jump to the next step? Um, I didn't jump to the next step. <laughs> Maybe it's, it needs a bit of, or am I not getting it? It's, it, it needs a, Ah, okay. So w when you when you think, okay, that, yeah, sorry. Uh, so when when do you have enough knowledge in the co core concepts that you can move on? Well, I don't think that there's a silver bullet for this, but at least for this is an advi ad advice that I'll have for the people that are starting with JavaScript or that are j that recently started. I think you should take close to your first two years of career to make sure that you have to work hard on this convention. This doesn't mean that you don't work with frameworks in that time. It doesn't mean that you don't learn frameworks. But what it means is that you should know that whenever you want to actually take that extra step and learn something new, you should focus on the core skills. So this is my advice, for at least for the first two years of career. What font did you use for the presentation? Uh, I'll post it on Twitter if, if you want. It's, uh, it's standard from slides.com. Is the JavaScript fatigue actually coming from the fact that front-enders don't know data structures and algorithms well enough compared to back-end devs? Partially, yes. But I think that the world that people that work today in JavaScript are also back end. Uh, let's do a show of hands. How many of you started from back end here? Okay. <laughs> so I <laughs> guess it answers the question. Now I think, yeah, for, for front end developers it was it was harder to grasp at first, but now as we work as JavaScript developers, I think we are past that. We we blended the line basically. How are we heading towards convention? Yes, we shifted the parallel towards the component driven architecture, but everything is so op opinionated. Well, you could say that a convention is also opinionated because there are some subject matter experts this agreed that, okay, this is the, the right way to do it or proved that this is the right way to do it. Um, I, don't, I don't think that they are opposed, basically. Once, why MVC 2011, why components 2015? Well, <laughs> MVC, uh, MVC on the front end, right, on the, in the JavaScript world really kicked in around, uh, okay, it was 2009, I think already there were some ideas, but it really kicked in with Angular 2011. And components 2015, I think 2015 was like the, that inflection point in history where like that was the year that most of you remember as the fatigue year when things like, uh, there was first of all the standardization of the language, which caught everybody by surprise. Whoa, we have a new standard now. And then it was all the frameworks that were different at that time and React came with components which were around since 2012 as an idea in web components, but they just created a better way of expressing components. So I think if, if you look closely, ever since 2015, the ecosystem is moving in, into this conventional thinking. If you look at how, what, how different Angular 1 is, for example, compared to React, and how similar Angular 2 is now with React. And I think if you really look at it, it's, it's, it says a lot about moving towards conventions. Was MVC for front-end a bad idea? <laughs> That's a very good question. I, I wrote this article, maybe some of you read it, on uh, if, um, saying that MVC is dead for the front-end. Um, and in this article, I, I, uh, I suggested that we approached MVC because we had no knowledge of how, okay, what do we do now? We have these capabilities of building JavaScript apps, but we don't know how to structure them. So MVC was a very, is still probably the best choice for a, 
a monolithic backend application, so we naturally adopted it in the frame front-end world. So it wasn't a bad idea because I think it spawned a lot of a lot of good frameworks, and it 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 did its part into the evolution of, of JavaScript. Wasn't MVC the convention until 2015? Until components were adopted on the clients when it stopped being. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the MVC was the convention basically. But again, you wouldn't, you couldn't really say that uh, things were moving into towards a set of conventions or towards a, s a certain convention because. Frameworks were doing MVC differently. There was MVVM and MVC and MVP and MV something else. Uh, things like, if you, it was harder, at, at least that's my feeling, it was harder to jump from Angular to Ember, for example, or from Ember to Backbone compared to how it is today to, to jump from Angular 2 to React, where you, Again, you focus on, on the concepts behind and you understand that they're pretty much the same thing. Are components the right direction? Yes, for now. <laughs> I think they are the right direction. I think, it, I think only time will tell if, if we are actually moving in the wrong direction, but I think that there are a lot of signals that we are actually moving in the right way. Components and the idea of composing, right? The, the verb, the action, everything is for the best of, of things to happen. If you think of um, functional programming, right? Composing functions, that's the, that's the, it's a push towards composability. Object-oriented programming, JavaScript uh, teaches us now that object, uh, that composability is better than inheritance, right? prefer composition over inheritance. This is a very old thing. This is from the, from the Gang of Four book, 1995. But we are living it today, right? We work with components and we focus on components. So I think it's not just web components or not just components as UI components. It's the idea, of, the idea behind that's, that's that's the power of it. Should we move away from jQuery? No. No, no, we shouldn't. Um, if something works with jQuery, let it work with jQuery. I, 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 I was discussing um, a few nights ago with someone that um, we built this application um, at the company two years, three years ago or so, and since it's more than two years now that the app is running, it's written in Angular 1, Nobody touched the code base in production. There was no upgrade, no deploy, no nothing. Uh, the people that know how to deploy it left the company. So if we want to actually redeploy, it's an internal tool. So we, we don't think that we do uh, crappy work. So it's an internal tool, but it's still being used by our internal department, by, rec by HR. Uh, even today, without a flaw, the Angular 1, if it's working, why upgrade? Do you think... Uh, oh yeah, and about jQuery, one more thought. jQuery is one of the best designed libraries ever. If you ever want to test your JavaScript skills, take a look at the code base of jQuery. It has some of the greatest design patterns in, in JavaScript that you can see there being implemented. Do you think... Do I still have time for questions? Do you think Webpack will live a long time from now on, since it wasn't on the outer shell of the circle? Webpack as the library itself, I actually wanted to put it on the, on, on the outer circle, um, but I did not know exactly what to put there in, inside to, uh, the idea behind Webpack, because it, it's the idea that's powerful, and not the idea just that's using modules, but the idea of doing project setups with an easy, okay, let's say, uh, almost easy to learn configuration. <laughs> 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 you know, I think, I think Webpack will, uh, will live on. I mean, it, at this point, it's becoming too important for, f and too widespread. It's, it's similar to jQuery. jQuery will not die. 
I can pretty much bet that 10 years from now we will have, probably even still will have the vast majority of websites with jQuery. Considering Bob's learning example, do you think that someone can understand a framework built on top of JavaScript without knowledge of JavaScript, on JavaScript? Not understand, but use. Because what, that's what frameworks do. They give you this apparent power. You feel powerful when, building, when using a framework, like ah, learn Angular in 30 seconds with this easy to use tutorial, or learn React in 24 hours, or it's, it's the apparent productivity, right? Oh, I just built this blog with React. So cool, now I know React. No, you don't. That's the point. You have to, so that stands true. You cannot understand a framework without understanding the underlying abstractions, but you can use it. A lot of people use it. And that is a problem, which we are basically trying to solve. Components are in JavaScript since 2007, 2008. Yeah, like I said, components are in the, the idea of web components. Dates, I think, from 2011 or so. And I also disagree with people that say that React brought components into the world of, of web development because it, it didn't. It's just that the, the the way in which they implemented components made components mainstream. Right? This, is, this, is, this is important because if you have a group of people that know how to do components or, or that knew how to do components in 2011, that's fine. But you don't have a global movement. You don't have the ecosystem moving towards that. This is a very, at a very macro level, not individually speaking. Both OP and FP can be understood without a JavaScript background. Shouldn't they be the core? Uh, this is a tricky one. Yes, they can be understood, but I don't think that it makes sense to learn a paradigm in things like, in just as an abstracting thing, because you need to understand how the language actually takes advantage of that paradigm. And without learning functional programming in a language, you end up with knowing math, basically. Or without learning, understanding object-oriented programming in a language, it's more like UML diagrams, I don't know. It's, um, I think at, at the core, they sh maybe they even should be in, in the same circle, right? Not one without another. I just wanted to emphasize that JavaScript is at the center, because think of it for, for, for people starting that it will be very hard for someone who says, okay, I want to be a developer. Okay, take these books on functional programming and these books on object-oriented programming, and then I'll tell you what the programming language is. Yes, JavaScript is making us better professionals. The Node ecosystem heading towards convention. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, not really sure what to answer because I, I haven't worked with Node in the last couple of years, <laughs> months, let's say. Uh, so I'm not really up to date with that. But uh, Come join me later, and maybe we can spawn a discussion from this. Hmm? Yeah, the node. Yeah, yeah, me and Liran will be at the node corner outside, waving the node shield. Uh, what will be next? Where is JavaScript going? I don't think that we will see another revolution like in 2019, if that's the question. I think that uh, we we will go down this set of conventions. But what will be next is most likely um, in the, let's say, ne middle future or just like, okay, years from now, then we're going to see a lot more convention on building up uh, towards WebAssembly and what's happening now with, with the, the push towards WebAssembly. And then in the foreseeable, I mean, the, the, the far future, honestly, I don't think that 
you shouldn't put your money that JavaScript will still be here. It might be here as a platform to run things on, things like Elm, for example, or um, we might not code in 10, 15 years from now. There might be AI doing that for us. I think what's important is that we keep these concepts. Remember, this is, this is the knowledgeable trans uh, the, um, transferable knowledge that we have. We can take this from JavaScript and apply it somewhere else. Or at least more than 50% of the knowledge, we can apply it somewhere else and we can build from that also. Does JavaScript fatigue uh, also come from the tooling used on our projects, not just the overall architecture of the JavaScript code? Yes, there is a lot of tooling fatigue, actually. It's one, maybe one of the most, uh, it's one, maybe one of the biggest drivers for fatigue um, today. So people still st feel this fatigue today because of, because of this um, tooling and project setups. Um, and uh, we have uh, a bit, just a bit later, we have Guillermo on stage. And he will show you more about Next.js. That's one of the frameworks that actually is it's fighting that part of the, of the fatigue, the, the setup and, uh, <clears throat> and tooling. Do you think Flux is here to stay? Maybe something new comes and it throws it, just like Flux it on MVC. Um, again, it's, 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 again, it's a very, it's not a, I don't think that there's a straight answer to this. Not, I, my personal opinion is that the Flux way of thinking is, a much, is much better for, for architecting applications, for building scalable applications. That, that's what matters here, right? When, when, you want to scale, when you have a blog, when you have a basic CRUD app, you can do MVC, you can do jQuery, it doesn't matter. We are, thinking, we are talking here about what it means to scale applications, what it means to uh, to, to look ahead and think, okay, my code base will not be the same in five years from now, but it will follow the same principles. It will follow along the same conventions. I'm going in the right path with this. MVC versus components. Read the article that I wrote. I think I talked too much about this already. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>